Section 12 On the morrow of this death, Eugenie felt a new motive for attachment to the house in which she was born, where she had suffered so much, where her mother had just died. She could not see the window and the chair on its casters without weeping. She thought she had mistaken the heart of her old father when she found herself the object of his tenderest cares. He came in the morning and gave her his arm to take her to breakfast. He looked at her for hours together with an eye that was almost kind. He brooded over her as though she had been gold. The old man was so unlike himself, he trembled so often before his daughter, that Nanon and the Cruchotines, who witnessed his weakness, attributed it to his great age, and feared that his faculties were giving away. But the day on which the family put on their mourning, and after dinner, to which meal Maitre Cruchot, the only person who knew his secret, had been invited, the conduct of the old miser was explained. "'My dear child,' he said to Eugenie when the table had been cleared and the doors carefully shut, "'you are now your mother's heiress, and we have a few little matters to settle between us. Isn't that so, Cruchot?' "'Yes.' is it necessary to talk of them to-day father yes yes little one i can't bear the uncertainty in which i'm placed i think you don't want to give me pain oh father well then let us settle it all to-night what is it you wish me to do my little girl it is not for me to say tell her cruchot mademoiselle your father does not wish to divide the property nor sell the estate nor pay enormous taxes on the ready money which he may possess therefore to avoid all this he must be released from making the inventory of his whole fortune part of which you inherit from your mother and which is now undivided between you and your father cruchot are you quite sure of what you are saying before you tell it to a mere child let me tell it my own way, Grandet. Yes, yes, my friend, neither you nor my daughter wish to rob me, do you, little one? But, Monsieur Cruchot, what am I to do? said Eugenie impatiently. Well, said the notary, it is necessary to sign this deed, by which you renounce your rights to your mother's estate and leave your father the use and disposition, during his lifetime, of all the property undivided between you of which he guarantees you the capital i do not understand a word of what you are saying returned eugenie give me the deed and show me where i am to sign it pere grandet looked alternately at the deed and at his daughter at his daughter and at the deed undergoing as he did so such violent emotion that he wiped the sweat from his brow my little girl he said if instead of signing this deed which will cost a great deal to record you would simply agree to renounce your rights as heir to your poor dear deceased mother's property and would trust to me for the future i should like it better in that case i will pay you monthly the good round sum of a hundred francs see now you could pay for as many masses as you want for anybody eh a hundred francs a month in livres i will do all you wish father mademoiselle said the notary it is my duty to point out to you that you are despoiling yourself without guarantee good heavens what is all that to me hold your tongue cruchot it's settled all settled cried grandet taking his daughter's hand and striking it with his own eugenie you won't go back on your word you are an honest girl eh oh father he kissed her effusively and pressed her in his arms till he almost choked her go my good child you restore your father's life but you only return to him that which he gave you we are quits this is how business should be done life is a business i bless you you are a virtuous girl and you love your father do just what you like in future to-morrow cruchot he added looking at the horrified notary you will see about preparing the deed of relinquishment and then enter it on the records of the court the next morning eugenie signed the papers by which she herself completed her spoliation 
at the end of the first year however in spite of his bargain the old man had not given his daughter one sou of the hundred francs he had so solemnly pledged to her when eugenie pleasantly reminded him of this he could not help colouring and went hastily to his secret hiding-place from whence he brought down about a third of the jewels he had taken from his nephew and gave them to her there little one he said in a sarcastic tone do you want those for your twelve hundred francs oh father truly will you really give them to me i'll give you as many more next year he said throwing them into her apron so before long you'll get all his gewgaws he added rubbing his hands delighted to be able to speculate on his daughter's feelings nevertheless the old man though still robust felt the importance of initiating his daughter into the secrets of his thrift and its management for two consecutive years he made her order the household meals in his presence and receive the rents and he taught her slowly and successively the names and remunerative capacity of his vineyards and his farms about the third year he had so thoroughly accustomed her to his avaricious methods that they had turned into the settled habits of her own life and he was able to leave the household keys in her charge without anxiety and to install her as mistress of the house five years passed away without a single event to relieve the monotonous existence of eugenie and her father the same actions were performed daily with the automatic regularity of clockwork the deep sadness of mademoiselle grandet was known to every one but if others surmised the cause she herself never uttered a word that justified the suspicions which all saumur entertained about the state of the rich heiress's heart her only society was made up of the three cruchots and a few of their particular friends whom they had little by little introduced into the grandet household they had taught her to play whist and they came every night for their game during the year eighteen twenty seven her father feeling the weight of his infirmities was obliged to initiate her still further into the secrets of his landed property and told her that in case of difficulty she was to have recourse to maitre cruchot whose integrity was well known to him towards the end of this year the old man then eighty-two was seized by paralysis which made rapid progress dr bergerin gave him up eugenie feeling that she was about to be left alone in the world came as it were nearer to her father and clasped more tightly this last living link of affection to her mind as in that of all loving women love was the whole of life charles was not there and she devoted all her care and attention to the old father whose faculties had begun to weaken though his avarice remained instinctively acute the death of this man offered no contrast to his life in the morning he made them roll him to a spot between the chimney of his chamber and the door of the secret room which was filled no doubt with gold he asked for an explanation of every noise he heard even the slightest to the great astonishment of the notary he even heard the watchdog yawning in the courtyard he woke up from his apparent stupor at the day and hour when the rents were due or when accounts had to be settled with his vine dressers and receipts given at such times he worked his chair forward on its casters until he faced the door of the inner room he made his daughter open it and watched while she placed the bags of money one upon another in his secret receptacles and relocked the door then she returned silently to her seat after giving him the key which he replaced in his waistcoat pocket and fingered from time to time his old friend the notary feeling sure that the rich heiress would inevitably marry his nephew the president if charles grandet did not return redoubled all his attentions he came every day to take grandet's orders went on his errands to froidfond to the farms and the fields and the vineyards sold the vintages and turned everything into gold and silver which found their way in sacks to the secret hiding-place at length the last struggle came in which the strong frame of the old man slowly yielded to destruction 
he was determined to sit at the chimney corner facing the door of the secret room he drew off and rolled up all the coverings which were laid over him saying to nanon put them away lock them up for fear they should be stolen so long as he could open his eyes in which his whole being had now taken refuge he turned them to the door behind which lay his treasures saying to his daughter are they there are they there in a tone of voice which revealed a sort of panic fear yes my father she would answer take care of the gold put gold before me eugenie would then spread coins on a table before him and he would sit for hours together with his eyes fixed upon them like a child who at the moment it first begins to see gazes in stupid contemplation at the same object and like the child a distressful smile would flicker upon his face it warms me he would sometimes say as an expression of beatitude stole across his features when the cure of the parish came to administer the last sacraments the old man's eyes sightless apparently for some hours kindled at the sight of the cross the candlesticks and the holy water vessel of silver he gazed at them fixedly at his when moved for the last time when the priest put the crucifix of silver gilt to his lips that he might kiss the christ he made a frightful gesture as if to seize it and that last effort cost him his life he called eugenie whom he did not see though she was kneeling beside him bathing with tears his stiffening hand which was already cold my father bless me she entreated take care of it all you will render me an account yonder he said proving by these last words that christianity must always be the religion of misers eugenie grandet was now alone in the world in that gray house with none but nanon to whom she could turn with the certainty of being heard and understood nanon the sole being who loved her for herself and with whom she could speak of her sorrows la grande nanon was a providence for eugenie she was not a servant but a humble friend after her father's death eugenie learned from maitre cruchot that she possessed an income of three hundred thousand francs from landed and personal property in the arrondissement of saumur also six millions invested at three per cent in the funds bought at sixty and now worth seventy-six francs also two millions in gold coin and a hundred thousand francs in silver crown pieces besides all the interest which was still to be collected the sum total of her property reached seventeen millions where is my cousin was her one thought the day on which maitre cruchot handed in to his client a clear and exact schedule of the whole inheritance eugenie remained alone with nanon sitting beside the fireplace in the vacant hall where all was now a memory from the chair on casters which her mother had sat in to the glass from which her cousin drank nanon we are alone yes mademoiselle and if i knew where he was the darling i'd go on foot to find him the ocean is between us she said while the poor heiress wept in company of an old servant in that cold dark house which was to her the universe the whole province rang from nantes to orleans with the seventeen millions of mademoiselle grandet among her first acts she had settled an annuity of twelve hundred francs on nanon who already possessed of six hundred more became a rich and enviable match in less than a month that good soul passed from single to wedded life under the protection of antoine cornoyer who was appointed keeper of all mademoiselle grandet's estates madame cornoyer possessed one striking advantage over her contemporaries although she was fifty-nine years of age she did not look more than forty her strong features had resisted the ravages of time thanks to the healthy customs of her semi-conventual life 
she laughed at old age from the vantage ground of a rosy skin and an iron constitution perhaps she never looked as well in her life as she did on her marriage day she had all the benefits of her ugliness and was big and fat and strong with a look of happiness on her indestructible features which made a good many people envy cornoyer fast colors said the draper quite likely to have children said the salt merchant she's pickled in brine saving your presence she is rich and that fellow cornoyer has done a good thing for himself said a third man when she came forth from the old house on her way to the parish church nanon who was loved by all the neighborhood received many compliments as she walked down the tortuous street eugenie had given her three dozen silver forks and spoons as a wedding present cornoyer amazed at such magnificence spoke of his mistress with tears in his eyes he would willingly have been hacked in pieces in her behalf madame cornoyer appointed housekeeper to mademoiselle grandet got as much happiness out of her new position as she did from the possession of a husband she took charge of the weekly accounts she locked up the provisions and gave them out daily after the manner of her defunct master she ruled over two servants a cook and a maid whose business it was to mend the house linen and make mademoiselle's dresses cornoyer combined the functions of keeper and bailiff it is unnecessary to say that the women servants selected by nanon were perfect treasures mademoiselle grandet thus had four servants whose devotion was unbounded the farmers perceived no change after monsieur grandet's death the usages and customs he had sternly established were scrupulously carried out by monsieur and madame cornoyer at thirty years of age eugenie knew none of the joys of life her pale sad childhood had glided on beside a mother whose heart always misunderstood and wounded had known only suffering leaving this life joyfully the mother pitied the daughter because she still must live and she left in her child's soul some fugitive remorse and many lasting regrets eugenie's first and only love was a wellspring of sadness within her meeting her lover for a few brief days she had given him her heart between two kisses furtively exchanged then he had left her and a whole world lay between them this love cursed by her father had cost the life of her mother and brought her only sorrow mingled with a few frail hopes thus her upward spring towards happiness had wasted her strength and given her nothing in exchange for it in the life of the soul as in the physical life there is an inspiration and a respiration the soul needs to absorb the sentiments of another soul and assimilate them that it may render them back enriched were it not for this glorious human phenomenon there would be no life for the heart air would be wanting it would suffer and then perish eugenie had begun to suffer for her wealth was neither a power nor a consolation she could not live except through love through religion through faith in the future love explained to her the mysteries of eternity her heart and the gospel taught her to know two worlds she bathed night and day in the depths of two infinite thoughts which for her may have had but one meaning she drew back within herself loving and believing herself beloved for seven years her passion had invaded everything her treasuries were not the millions whose revenues were rolling up they were charles dressing-case the portraits hanging above her bed the jewels recovered from her father and proudly spread upon a bed of wool in a drawer of the oaken cabinet the thimble of her aunt used for a while by her mother which she wore religiously as she worked at a piece of embroidery a penelope's web begun for the sole purpose of putting upon her finger that gold so rich in memories it seemed unlikely that mademoiselle grandet would marry during the period of her mourning her genuine piety was well known consequently the cruchots whose policy was sagely guided by the old abbe 
contented themselves for the time being with surrounding the great heiress and paying her the most affectionate attentions every evening the hall was filled with a party of devoted cruchotines who sang the praises of its mistress in every key she had her doctor in ordinary her grand almoner her chamberlain her first lady of honor her prime minister above all her chancellor a chancellor who would fain have said much to her if the heiress had wished for a train-bearer one would instantly have been found she was a queen obsequiously flattered flattery never emanates from noble souls it is the gift of little minds who thus still further belittle themselves to worm their way into the vital being of the persons around whom they crawl flattery means self-interest so the people who night after night assembled in mademoiselle grandet's house they called her mademoiselle de froidfond outdid each other in expressions of admiration this concert of praise never before bestowed upon eugenie made her blush under its novelty but insensibly her ear became habituated to the sound and however coarse the compliments might be she soon was so accustomed to hear her beauty lauded that if any newcomer had seemed to think her plain she would have felt the reproach far more than she might have done eight years earlier she ended at last by loving the incense which she secretly laid at the feet of her idol by degrees she grew accustomed to be treated as a sovereign and to see her court pressing around her every evening monsieur de bonfons was the hero of the little circle where his wit his person his education his amiability were perpetually praised one or another would remark that in seven years he had largely increased his fortune that bonfons brought in at least ten thousand francs a year and was surrounded like the other possessions of the cruchots by the vast domains of the heiress do you know mademoiselle said an habitual visitor that the cruchots have an income of forty thousand francs among them and then their savings exclaimed an elderly female cruchotine mademoiselle de gribeaucourt a gentleman from paris has lately offered monsieur cruchot two hundred thousand francs for his practice said another he will sell it if he is appointed juge de pays he wants to succeed monsieur de bonfons as president of the civil courts and is taking measures replied madame d'orsonval monsieur le president will certainly be made counsellor yes he is a very distinguished man said another don't you think so mademoiselle monsieur de bonfons endeavored to put himself in keeping with the role he sought to play in spite of his forty years in spite of his dusky and crabbed features withered like most judicial faces he dressed in youthful fashions toyed with a bamboo cane never took snuff in mademoiselle de froidfond's house and came in a white cravat and a shirt whose pleated frill gave him a family resemblance to the race of turkeys he addressed the beautiful heiress familiarly and spoke of her as our dear eugenie in short except for the number of visitors the change from loto to whist and the disappearance of monsieur and madame grandet the scene was about the same as the one with which this history opened the pack were still pursuing eugenie and her millions but the hounds more in number lay better on the scent and beset the prey more unitedly if charles could have dropped from the indian isles he would have found the same people and the same interests madame des grassins to whom eugenie was full of kindness and courtesy still persisted in tormenting the cruchots eugenie as in former days was the central figure of the picture and charles as heretofore would still have been the sovereign of all yet there had been some progress the flowers which the president formerly presented to eugenie on her birthdays and fete days had now become a daily institution every evening he brought the rich heiress a huge and magnificent bouquet which madame cornoyer placed conspicuously in a vase and secretly threw into a corner of the courtyard when the visitors had departed 
early in the spring madame des grassins attempted to trouble the peace of the cruchotines by talking to eugenie of the marquis de froidfond whose ancient and ruined family might be restored if the heiress would give him back his estates through marriage madame des grassins rang the changes on the peerage and the title of marquise until mistaking eugenie's disdainful smile for acquiescence she went about proclaiming that the marriage with monsieur cruchot was not nearly as certain as people thought though monsieur de froidfond is fifty she said he does not look older than monsieur cruchot he is a widower and he has children that's true but then he is a marquis he will be peer of france and in times like these where will you find a better match i know it for a fact that pere grandet when he put all his money into froidfond intended to graft himself upon that stock he often told me so he was a deep one that old man ah nanon said eugenie one night as she was going to bed how is it that in seven years he has never once written to me End of section